first session tackles the topic of financial health and its relevance for the developing world. Judith Carl, who is Executive Secretary of the United Nations Capital Development Fund, will be presenting on that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Judith Carl, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Capital Development Fund. I'm delighted to join you virtually as Singapore hosts this annual event, bringing governments, private sector, and communities together at such an important time when the world is battling through the pandemic. And as we're looking back to reflect and learn on what has gotten us here and how we should be planning to build for a better future. Before I start, I'd like to take a moment to extend my gratitude to all of you for making the time to be here with us and to consider what financial health truly means for the people and communities we serve and what we can do to enhance it. There could be no better time than today to reflect as to why financial health should be a focus for governments, for the private sector alike. As I see it, helping deliver and strengthen financial health is a natural and important part of our mission to make finance work for the poor, particularly for those in the last mile. We've all witnessed the great progress achieved with financial inclusion over the past decade and its acceleration thanks to the massive deployment of digital finance. Over the last years, we've dedicated our time and efforts to expand access to financial services and to drive usage. According to the Global Findex, 1.2 billion adults have obtained an account since 2011, including 515 million since 2014. Between 2014 and 2017, the share of adults with a financial account rose globally from 62% to 69%. Developing countries during that same period saw this proportion increase from 54% to 63%. These numbers show that we are making progress in bringing many unbanked and underbanked adults into the formal financial system. And as we have achieved these early gains in financial inclusion, the metrics that were used to measure success at that time were appropriate, from the number of account holders, to the number of withdrawals and deposits, from the number of digital payments, to existing gender gaps, and so on. These indicators helped us measure the extent of financial inclusion. But what did they tell us about how a person, a family, or a community is able to navigate their lives? How does knowing the number of account holders tell us whether a family or an individual is able to withstand financial calamity without liquidating their assets? How does the number of withdrawals tell us if a family is able to send its children to school? And how does the number of digital payments tell us if a couple can pay for medical needs without going under? Ultimately, how do we know that access to a bank account or the usage of a deposit scheme or digital credit translates into actually improving the lives of people, whether it's placing more income in their hands, lifting them out of poverty, or making societies more equal, all of which would directly contribute to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. This is where financial health comes in. There are many definitions of financial health, but one I'd like to use is the one provided by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in the United States. According to the CFPB, financial well-being or financial health describes a condition wherein a person can fully meet current and ongoing financial obligations, can feel secure in their financial future, and are able to make choices to allow them to enjoy life. This definition is a reflection of an individual's resilience, security, and agency, and by extension reflects the resilience and strengths of the community, society, and economy that this individual inhabits. The critical question before us is how to advance financial health, particularly for those who have traditionally been underserved by the financial ecosystem and largely excluded from the real economy. As a result of the work done by UNCDF and others in the space of financial inclusion, there are important lessons as we move the needle to more impact-focused and transition from financial inclusion to financial health. Let me highlight three of those lessons. First, we need to understand the trade-offs of digital innovations to truly deliver on financial health. On the one hand, these innovations are making transactions, services, and access to financial tools simpler, faster, and more affordable. 
which in turn has enabled economic participation at an unprecedented scale. Many women, youth, and seniors, population segments that have historically been at the greatest risk of being left behind, are now benefiting from the inclusivity that modern technology and business models are making possible. Yet those same innovations are driving exclusionary profiling and technological biases. So no one should ever make the mistake of assuming that digital innovation is automatically synonymous with financial inclusion. The challenge is to maximize technology's potential and minimize its risks to ensure that many more end users are being reached in a meaningful way and that their lives, their financial lives and their everyday lives are improved. Whether and how these trade-offs are taken into account as we design and deliver these technological tools becomes very important. Second, if we're going to cater to the end consumer with the goal of making her or him more financially healthy and resilient, then we need to understand that consumer's motivations and actions at a more fundamental level. The world of behavioral economics teaches us that consumers often act against their own true interests, resorting to short-term thinking rather than long-term planning, and they may need some support to cultivate financially healthy habits. So we will need more behavioral experiments and research engagements that will help us generate a strong evidence base to better inform our financial interventions, whether they're automatic income deductions or savings reminders. The third lesson is that public and private sector partnerships to drive financial health need to be cross-sectoral. There's a tremendous business case to be explored in financial health. Financially healthy customers will save more, borrow, and repay in a healthy fashion and ensure themselves adequately to mitigate risks. These behaviors are aligned with the private sector's bottom line and contribute to a healthy financial and fintech sector. For regulators, financial health has always been paramount. The security and well being of the end consumer directly influences regulatory policies on client and data protection principles. But financial health does not exist in a vacuum. It is inextricably linked to the real economy. Financial health can drive good personal health and education outcomes, as well as reduce poverty and inequalities. And if we want to achieve a broader way of SDGs, whether it's good health and well being, quality education, or reduced inequalities, then the financial health of end consumers is a necessary objective. This is precisely why governments, the private sector and NGOs, as well as the multilateral donor community need to link the agenda of financial health with other sectors such as education, health and labor, highlighting how financial health can help achieve related SDGs. We will need significant investments in health, education and employment that should also be connected to a concerted cross-sectoral effort to improve the financial lives of the populations concerned. At UNCDF, our mission involves making finance work for the poor and to achieve the signal promise of the SDGs, to leave no one behind. The core principle of our strategy, leaving no one behind in the digital era, is that financial inclusion is not an end, but a means to an end. That is why you can expect UNCDF to work towards reaching a range of customer segments, including women, youth, seniors, migrants, informal workers and refugees, to help them earn more, plan and spend wisely, save appropriately, borrow healthily, and manage risks well. And we cannot pursue this important work in advancing financial health without our partners, both the private sector and regulators, as well as our counterparts, governments, multilaterals, and donors. The Center for Financial Health and Living Labs, proposed to be established in Singapore and several markets across Asia and Africa, is an effort to work with government, industry and markets at large to build on this topic, provide a convening platform to bring together institutions to learn from each other and develop thought leadership that could be taken across the world. In closing, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Monetary Authority of Singapore for this platform at the Singapore FinTech Festival for this very important discussion. To the private and public sector present here, I wish to reiterate UNCDF's commitment to develop partnerships to build inclusive and resilient economies that put the financial health of end consumers front and center. Thank you so much.
and we look forward to the discussions. Uh, good morning, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, Judith, for articulating to us the need for having this conversation on financial health, especially as we think of leaving no one behind and, you know, building back better uh, post pandemic, you know, especially to kind of look at achieving the sustainable development goals 2030. Uh, I'm just Preet Singh, your moderator for the session on financial health and relevance for developing world. We are joined by an eminent group of panelists today with us who who come from different sectors, from policy, from private sector, you know, and sharing the advocacy landscape of around financial inclusion globally. And I think as Judith pointed out, uh, you know, there has been a great stride being made towards inclusion objectives with multi billion of accounts being opened over this decade with, you know, millions and billions of dollars flowing through digital payments uh, and that we have seen in a big surge, especially the in the COVID era uh, as we stand today. But, you know, there is a big question in terms of what is the correlation between being giving a bank account and actually leaving, leading a financially healthy life. And I think this is, you know, where the conversation has to really now begin. And that's what we intend to unpack uh, in today's conversation. That And this is a you know, discussion between uh, the difference of output and outcomes, whereas financial inclusion has been a very output focused growth agenda where we have been you know, pursuing the idea of infrastructure development at last mile, providing accounts and wallets, you know, create, bringing people into a formal economy. But then the outcome that leads towards it in terms of impact in pe on people's life or the, you know, their economic well-being is still a big question that is unanswered in many ways. And I think this is you know, where we intend to take our discussion forward today in this conversation. I'll, I'll just kind of like to put in a couple of stats you know, in order to kind of give a sense of how we would like to unpack this discussion with our eminent panelists and as I introduce them uh, during the course of uh, this discussion. In 2019, a study in US showed that 35% of the US citizens were not able to come up with $400 of emergency saving if they require one today. And, and that is in a country which is near financial inclusion, right? And in the same study, only 29% of actual Americans were found to be financially healthy. Nonetheless, coming to a developing country, Kenya has been a poster child for the financial inclusion development for long years, you know, with mobile money and mobile wallets uh, being one of the first, uh, you know, taking shape in that market. We have seen great progress with, you know, wallets and bank accounts with almost uh, close to 83% of Kenyans having an account or a wallet in some form. But in the same period of 2019, only 22% of Kenyans were actually financially healthy. Various reasons, you know, right from easy access to credit, to frictionless access to payments. There are multiple reasons, you know, that is kind of building up to uh, services being offered, but, you know, not leading to people being able to maintain financial resilience in their life or uh, achieve financial security in different ways. And this pandemic has in no way helped it. It has further amplified this conversation because, you know, we saw that uh, in the initial uh, lockdown periods when countries were going in lockdown, people were leaving, uh, losing a lot of income you know, they were also struggling to meet their end needs. There were issues of lives and livelihood and, you know, how will that kind of converge? So the question that we intend to explore is, is financial inclusion vision as of as it is today enough? Or do we need to really broaden out the vision and look at, you know, a new vision which will help us achieve to a better success or, you know, building back better if you want to achieve SDGs, especially. Joining me today uh, are four different individuals who, who bring in, a range of experience in this uh, work of financial inclusion and you know how we need to be looking at it. I'm joined by Mr. N.S. Vishwanathan, who is a former Reserve Bank of India Deputy Governor. He just uh, moved out from a Deputy Governor position this year. He has been leading Reserve Bank of India's work or India's work on many of uh, the fronts around financial stability, on regulations with banking. He's been at the forefront and helm of driving the inclusion agenda in India over last uh, decade and so. Uh, he joined Reserve Bank of India in 1981. And thank you so much, Mr. Vishwanathan, for joining us today. I'm also 
joined by Ms. Pia Tayag. She is the director of Her Majesty Queen Maxima's office. Uh, Queen Maxima is the advocate for inclusive finance and advocate of the Secretary General. Uh, Ms. Tayag joined the office of UNSG after spending almost 18 years at uh, BSP, the Central Bank of Philippines. And she has been the managing director of the Center for Learning and Inclusion Advocacy at BSP. Thank you so much, Priya, for joining us uh, in this conversation. We have Mr. Mohammad Khalil with us, who has been, uh, who comes from Australia, and you know he has been leading the work uh, on Commonwealth Australia. I must, I must actually say that uh, in my conversations, you know, across multiple banks. I've seen Commonwealth Bank of Australia to be one of them, you know, who has been at the forefront of looking at how do we move beyond inclusion into the domain of financial well-being and financial wellness and health, and what does it mean really to uh, move in the direction? And uh, Mohammed Khalil, you know, uh, has been leading the team and the effort at the group level to make that shift from inclusion to financial well-being. And I'm sure, you know, we'll kind of learn more from his experience uh, in the private sector and, you know, what will take a bank to move in the direction. So thank you so much, Mohammed Khalil, for joining us on this panel. Not last but not the least is with uh, with us is Mary Vaughan, uh, or Mawe is how you how we pronounce uh, the name, and uh, she's from Equity Bank. And and you know to to a global audience, Equity Bank is one of the most known entities in the Africa region, especially that has a big foothold serving the low and moderate income clients across the major parts of East and, and East Africa. And she joins us, you know, bringing in both her experience of building towards uh, addressing the needs of this low income community, but also in terms of, you know, sharing the journey in terms of how Equity Bank uh, is trying to serve the last mile in a manner that, you know, they can be more financially resilient and, and secure. We, we will spend almost 40 minutes in our conversation. Uh, and we'll make it more of a conversation, you know, where you will hear about their views and their journeys and, you know, where where do they think we need to be going with the inclusion agenda down the line. Uh, we'll have a chance towards, you know, having a Q&A towards the end of the session to please uh, put in your questions to the uh, question and answer chat box and we are happy to take it towards the end of the session. So not taking too much time, I'd like to start on with maybe Mr. Vish with Mr. Vishwanathan. And, you know, we have seen that India has been at the forefront of inclusion journey over last uh, four or five years, especially with you know millions of accounts being opened. Obviously, a uh, great infrastructure like India Stack, which allows for a last mile connectivity at a very very low cost. And we have seen Reserve Bank of India, you know, allowing multiple form of players to come into the sector and you know serve the uh, last mile customers at best. What I really want to understand from you, Mr. Vishwanathan, is what is the end goal from a policy perspective when you think of financial inclusion? And could you help us elaborate on some of these goals that you think are going to be the focus for the Reserve Bank over the next four or five years, especially after achieving such a great feat in terms of accounts and infrastructure? Mr. Vishwanathan. Thank you. And at the outset, let me say thankful to you for having me in this panel. Uh, the first step in financial inclusion is providing access to the formal financial sector. Without that, you know, as economists call the necessary condition, you don't pursue financial inclusion and inclusive growth. But as, uh, you know, Judith said earlier, it's a means to an end. But how do we provide access in a country like India? Uh, prior to 2014, there were a lot of efforts to make banks open accounts for all the customers or all the adult population. Uh, Various persuasive efforts did not work. So what was what happened was in 2014, uh, the accounting op account opening was done you know, on a camp mode. This is that banks went down to villages, and you know, uh, fortunately we had the benefit of the unique identification card, which is the Aadhaar, based on which you know accounts could be opened, and uh, that's how a large number of accounts were opened in a in a short period of time. The second part was that. You need to have supply of formal financial services. Uh, one, the, uh, even when there are bank accounts open, we found that many accounts did not have transactions. Some had transactions, many did not have any transactions because the bank branch was too far away. So the bank people did not find it possible to go to a bank branch to do their transactions, which is where 
we moved to those differentiated licensing, one in the form of the small finance banks. The small finance banks, you know, well, many of them were telephone, mobile telephone operators, you know, who could kind of use their infrastructure to reach the last mile, number one. Second was the small finance banks. The small finance banks had a, an asset site mandate to, you know, de- lend to those people who are in the lower economic strata. So the strategy in terms of opening number of accounts, uh, differentiated uh, bank licensing, providing digital platforms or the India stack as we call it, all these were uh, aimed at two, three things. One, re- uh, providing access, which I said is a necessary condition. Number two is creating a supply side imperative. The supply side inter- imperative is unless there is, you know, um, or there is some kind of a mandate. I- I'll come to that later. The private sector banks were not very keen to lend to the lower economic strata. Uh, so the small finance banks uh, had a mandate to lend up to 50% of their book to of uh, loans of small ticket size. That's the first thing. Secondly, uh, we also must understand that in a country like India, uh, with, uh, which is so diverse, economically diverse, uh, you know, there will be people with different kinds of economic needs. And therefore, you need also credit institutions with different risk appetites. So obviously, a bank may not lend to a person without a credit history. So what the RBI did was to, you know, strengthen the microfinance institution regulatory framework, uh, which in terms of, you know, what they could lend, whom they could lend to, and what kind of credit information they need to have, that was also put in place. Parallelly, uh, we uh, strengthened the credit information bureau system where the data, uh, the data collection, data dissemination, data pulling, all these were made mandatory. And as a result of which, the microfinance institution borrowers were able to graduate later to a borrower whom the banks would want to lend. So what happens is, fundamentally, why we want people to move from the non-bank to bank is that the cost of funds for a bank is relatively lower because the non-banks borrow from banks in turn or from the uh, high-cost deposits or high-cost bonds. So as the borrower becomes more creditworthy, he is able to move to a, a bank and you know access funds at a lower rate. Secondly, a bank is able to stand with that borrower once they have been able to establish this financial credibility. Lastly, I think there is a the, as you said the India uh, India stack and the, uh, the information stack that we created also enabled uh, banks to access data from various sites to provide credit. So w- what is the end in all of all this? Uh, fundamentally, we believe that. If there are people in the lower economic strata, their economic activity is likely to be impinged by non-availability of credit. And therefore, the first thing that we need to them is to enable them to access credit from the formal sector at a reasonable cost. So the entire effort, if you ask me, in terms of various steps that we have taken, the objective was to first meet the necessary condition, which is that provide access to formal system, number one. Number two, create an ecosystem where there is supply of credit to those people who would not have otherwise been eligible to get those kind of loans or people not approach them to get those kind of loans. And I think ultimately, it is when there is access to a formal financial system and access to credit at a reasonable cost that you can see people in the lower economic strata developing. Having said that, oh, you know, yeah. I, I, I think, I think um, uh, Judith also pointed out, ultimately it's also overall economic growth. You need to have economic growth so that the low households become economically strong. And more strong they are, the lesser their vulnerability to meet you know, an economic crisis. Got it. No, no, thank you so much. I think uh, I do agree with the point that you know we started inclusion on a growth agenda. But you know in order for it to capture into an economic welfare agenda, you know we need to kind of you know move boundaries away from just the infrastructure and I think you're right you know we have got to a great degree in such a last mile accounts and everything but possibly you know the question is uh, is from a policy perspective what else do we need to do down the line and I think I'll come back to you in a moment on that again and you know I, I like to pick up on you know what you mentioned uh, Vishwanathan sir and maybe you know uh, go to Pia on this and, and you kind of alluded to that that you know we had different kind of institutions which have been coming into the you know, business of providing 
financial intermediation in a way. We had banks, we had fintech. Now we have platforms and all form of technology companies getting into the space. And you know, for different reasons, there are positive and negatives. You know, we will, when we look at it. Now, trust is a vital link between fund institutions providing financial services and customers. How do we? How do you see PIA? customer protection in context of achieving customer well-being and are the mechanism and actions enough to instill trust with the low and moderate income clients especially what should be the role of policy maker and that of private sector in this i'm asking this also from the fact that mr vishwanathan also pointed that you know credit supply has been one at the forefront of you know uh, engaging or formalization process so you know uh, in that in that process you know where does customer protection really come into play? Yeah, thank you for that question, Jaspreet. And first of all, thank you to MAS um, and the UNCDF for inviting the Office of the UNSGSA to the Singapore FinTech Festival, particularly on this very um, important topic. And um, your question, um, Jaspreet, of course, on, on the entry of new players, you know, innovations in business models and digitalization is really providing so much opportunity for financial inclusion. You know, costs going down to reach broader markets, um, data being available to create more responsive products. But as you said, you know, in the pandemic, we saw also the scale of the possible, you know, numbers of transactions that could be done in, in delivering emergency payments, for example, really provide a lot of opportunities. But as you said, it also has attendant risks that need to be managed, you know, risks to customers, risks to further expanding the digital divide or um, disproportionately excluding vulnerable populations, for example, and ever and even risks to you know. And you talk about credit, um, you know, prov provision of uh, you know over indebtedness in in terms of very um, quick disbursements of credit, for example, are risks that need to be managed. And this is the reason why Her Majesty has always advocated for a set for the set of digital public goods or necessary conditions, as the DG has uh, mentioned, that need to be in place to make sure that um, all this innovation, all the new players are really able to create and contribute to an inclusive financial system. And the role here is really for everyone. You ask the right question, what is the role of private sector, of government, and even of consumers themselves? And these digital public goods speak to, of course, you know, interoperability, digital identification systems, but also it speaks to enabling policy and regulatory environment, digital literacy to make sure that the customers are also able to fully control and benefit from these um, digital financial services. And these digital public goods need to support efforts of both public and private players, as well as customers. And the intentionality that these innovations bring out positive outcomes needs to underpin all the actions across those actors. And that is how we will be able to truly say that, you know, these new players and these innovations are bringing about the positive outcomes that we want to see. And, you know, just, just, um, just some examples, for example, collaboration across uh, public and private sector, increasing digital li literacy on the part of the consumers are some of the you know, important um, conditions that need to be in place. And finally, your question about consumer protection, and we see that also as another, um, you know, necessary digital public good, and its relation to well-being, financial well-being. I would like to think of, um, you know, consumer protection as just one aspect, you know, um, in ensuring financial well-being and positive outcomes, because it is not just a matter of making sure that there is a framework to protect, there are systems of redress, um, you know, understanding and information is available, but also that, you know, financial well-being, there's also a role for the private sector to make sure that the products are designed with the end in mind, with positive outcomes in mind. There's also a role for the consumer to be digitally, you know, to, to have um, access to digital literacy tools. And it is a, an interplay of all these factors that will ensure that you know all this innovation indeed does contribute to financial well-being. No, I, thank you so much. I think that that kind of you know hit the nail as well. That it is an interplay of many factors, but also you know it's a 
it's a role that everyone has to kind of you know embrace uh, uh, to you know drive uh, the objective of towards a positive outcome for the customer at large and i think this is where you know i wanted to now step uh, to both the private sector players you know that we have today with us and ask them in terms of you know how do they see it in their context i'll start with maybe uh, mr khalil uh, you know commonwealth of australia and australia the country has you know obviously has a great uh, you, you know has done greatly on the inclusion goals but you know what we also know is that uh, the 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 country and the banks and institutions over there have been you know gradually moving towards making financial health and well-being a business priority i would really want to understand from you you know what does it mean to make it a business priority when you think of financial well-being what's in for customers how is it creating value for you as a bank and what specific actions you have taken to make it a big bank wide priority hallelujah to you great thank you so much transpreet and again thank you and it's an honor to be here to represent cba uh and i'd like to take a moment to pay my respects to the elders past present and future of the gadigal people of the our nation and all the first nations of australia on whose land i am um i think you know the 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 reason that it's a business priority for us is that when uh, you examine sort of the unique role that CBA has, the Commonwealth Bank has as a pillar bank in Australia, we recognize that that our success is tied to the long-term success of of our customers and our community. And so, since 2012, 2013, uh, we have made uh, um, you know improving the financial well-being of customers and communities uh, our vision and our mission as an organization. Uh, and in fact if you look at all of the major banks around the world and look at their mission statements vision statements you will find that at almost every single one of them there is this core sort of purpose around financial well-being financial prosperity uh and i think that you know we've just sort of recognized that it that that keeping it in that core bringing it to the to the surface was really important the value to customers is that it's allowed us to begin to deeply focus on trying to understand uh what financial well-being is uh, how we measure it uh and, and what role we as a bank can play in, in driving impact uh and you know the the ultimate sort of value that that generates is not only better products and services and experiences for our customers that improve their uh, outcomes over time but also means that we as an organization are able to innovate uh and to create uh these kinds of new solutions as a way to uh create shareholder value as well and we have you know 800,000 Australians who who uh rely on CBA to create that value as well the specific actions we've taken is to sort of begin to think about what are the capabilities what are the processes and then what are the solutions that we can deliver uh and what we found and and what resonated with me with some of the some of what the speakers have said earlier is that it does require a partnership with global experts and so we've established uh very deep working relationships with Harvard Sustainability Transparency and Accountability Research Lab uh the University of Chicago Center for Decision Research as well as some of the domestic universities that have a uh, deep experience in sort of building measures uh of of social impact uh those collaborations have allowed us to then uh think about how we improve our ability to experiment uh and to validate the impact that our efforts have and as a result drive a number of solutions out in market um you know we've done things like eliminate almost half a billion dollars in atm fees to broaden inclusion so that our customers have access to cash and this was pre-pandemic uh we've also uh developed uh experiences that have connected almost a million people with hundreds of millions of dollars in government benefits by simplifying that experience using behavioral principles using the the power of our digital platforms and the best of our technologies to simplify the process to make it easier for them to get the support that they need and we've also redesigned our products and launched new products as well as I mean, dozens of financial well-being digital features that have all contributed i think to uh, our ability to ensure that we meaningfully can improve the financial being of our customers and our communities. Thank you so much for that. Mo, I think I'll come back to you a little more to unpack on on the financial health output and outcomes discussion. Uh but before that you know I really like to kind of bring in um, Mary in this conversation. 
uh, and you know, Equity Bank, knowing that you know it is one of the major banks in Kenya, the growth of bank and country is interlinked in many ways. How do you see your role as a bank in building towards customer resilience and security, especially the low and moderate income client, which is actually part of your portfolio in a very, very big way? You know, we hear that what Mo said that every bank has this line in their vision that they would like to, you know, one way or the other, improve the health and well-being of the customers. What does it really mean to do that, actually? You know, beyond just providing accounts and services towards the end. Mary, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me say that and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's been a journey. And I think what is important is the lessons that we have learned over time in dealing with the customers and trying to understand what they need at every stage. I think the view about financial inclusion and financial health started with the, just the ability to open an account because that is what most customers did not have at this point in time. And then we were able to get there where we got uh, millions of accounts, customers being able to access the bank and, uh, and the bank products and all that. But then over time, they were able to get the financial savings products and then they were able to get a loan. And then we started asking ourselves, so when we give them a loan, for instance, what do they do with that money? And we thought that we need to do uh, another step and start financial literacy and training, both for the individual customers and also for the small businesses, the micro enterprises. When you get the money, how do you manage it? How do you manage your debts? You know, debt management is a component of the training. And we've been doing that under the group foundation. And I think we have seen very, very good results because um, we talk about over indebtedness, which is basically a result of financial mismanagement or financial indiscipline. So the aim of the program is to just make sure that our customers and others because that program is not restricted just to our customers. Anybody can benefit from that program, knows what they need to do with the money, uh, how to man manage their small businesses. They need to know what is the difference between the capital of my business and my own money, because that's also a factor of financial management. And that is what leads to growth in the business and sustainability. So there's a lot that has been done and of course, uh, the speakers before me have also talked about digitization. With the digitization, it's easier for us now to reach multiple customers. They are now able to access those trainings on their very simple feature phone. Uh, they, don't have a, they don't need to have a smartphone to be able to access uh, some of those uh, components of the trainings. And of course, we have put in a lot of uh, some other modules that are some of them social, like um, training for the mama who, who is uh, expecting, uh, who should I expect through pregnancy. Uh, we have some components of training for our small uh, farmers, uh, customers, uh, if they just need a bit of information on uh, the, the, the best practices or where to get the markets, you know, for their produce and all that. All that information is available. And we are being able to see a lot of progress being made there. But I must also say that one of the other lessons that we learned is that even as we give the cash, we also need to think about the whole um, way of life of the customer. We got some of the customers defaulting because they got sick or a member of the family got sick. Mm -hmm. And we said, let's start an insurance component, health insurance, so that when they get sick and their businesses do not suffer, they are still able to repay. If a family member suffers an illness, they are able to get a financial or rather health support without going back into the business to get the money to pay for, for that. So it has evolved over time. And I think the thinking now is also think about payments. How do you make it very easy for them to make payments uh, for their businesses or, you know, person to person businesses for their utilities and all that. And that is evolving every single day. So I think uh, we can see that we have made progress. The thinking is changing every single day. Right now, we're actually seeking, uh, talking about security for these customers. How do they feel the security as they hold their accounts, as they transact through their transactions online 
on the phone and all that because that has become a big issue, uh, of course, with the digitization. So we will keep on making the investments that we need to make thank on the systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So thanks, thanks for that, Mary. I think uh, before jumping to the conversation further, I just want to highlight two points, you know, which really struck me that, you know, digitization, we all spoke of it, how important it has been as an enabler. Uh, and I, re I remember stories, you know, way back, when we when we used to keep cash in pocket, we used to always, you know, hear the stories that, you know, cash in pocket with hot money, you should put it in a bank account, right? So that it can stay away from you and you are not having a tendency to spend it out, right? And now we have made digital so frictionless, so interoperable that, you know, you can walk into a shop, you know, do a QR code scan and make a payment, which actually brings back to that question, you know, that is, will that basically encourage more irrational decision making, irrational bu buying behaviors? You know, and how can, you know, people be able to plan or spend better? Because, you know, that also links to the fact that savings will keep on going down because, you know, things have become so interoperable and, and frictionless in a way. So where, what is that, you know, red line of balance that we need to maintain in doing that? And I, I think uh, we'll kind of come to that in a moment. But I want to bring in Mr. Vishwanathan again on this, uh, uh, you know, because we talk of policy actions that are required to shift the focus from output to outcome, sir. Okay. What, what I really want to understand is, is the focus on outcome, you know, when we think of financial resilience or security or freedom, you know, is it a better case towards achieving financial stability? Because, you know, when, when we talk to uh, regulators in general, you know, for them, the policy, key priority action for, for, on a policy that is more on uh, market integrity, financial stability, maybe consumer protection at large, right? Financial inclusion is a growth agenda and really doesn't really fit in with a priority in that way, you know, fair enough, there is a need for uh, infrastructure and balancing it out. But do you think broadening it out in terms of resilience and security from just access and usage makes for a better case of, you know, uh, achieving financial stability in a way? Yeah, I think so. In fact, uh, Reserve Bank has been maintaining, uh, even in, uh, in a, one of the, some of the speeches by our former executives, that financial stability and financial inclusion are two sides of the same coin. Uh, for example, one of the main arguments in favor, in favor of financial inclusion and instrument towards financial stability is that you are moving the economic operators from the unorganized sector to the segments of the financial institutions which are through which the monetary policy transmission happens. So more people, uh, you know, have the financial transactions with entities that are, you know, uh, impacted by the monetary policies of the Reserve Bank greater the transmission of the monetary policy implications. And one of the elements of monetary policy is, uh, you know, objective. One of the major objectives of monetary policy is, in, at least in the case of India, is inflation with growth. So, uh, and I think you, uh, you cannot, in, therefore, in, in RBI's view and in my view as well, uh, you cannot see financial inclusion as something opposed to financial stability. Because there have been people who have said that, for example, the subprime crisis is the case of an opposite, where, you know, you lend to, so many people who possibly, you know, did not have the capacity to pay. So um, everything, you know, everything is a question of getting the right balance. So you, you said, you know, interoperability makes, you know, a, a wallet as good as cash. So it's obviously getting the balance in the right place is what is important. But to say that financial inclusion will not lead to financial stability, or financial inclusion, financial stability happens without financial inclusion, I think it's not correct. It's for me an important uh, ingredient of that. And which is why I think this whole focus, you know, financial inclusion, why is financial inclusion focused on bringing people to the main sector? Financial inclusion is uh, uh, focused on bringing all the people to the formal sector so that the regulatory framework, the economic stability operations of the central bank or the government can have its full effect through the various layers through which it passes. And if it goes to a segment which is outside that purview, then those actions do not have any impact on them. So I think... Uh, I would say that financial uh, inclusion and financial stability has a very has a very, has a great linkages, and I can say that RBI has formally said that it pursues uh, financial inclusion as a part of its you know objective of achieving uh, financial stability. But so I have a follow-up question on that. Then you know, then how do you measure the achievement with financial inclusion? You know, we have the measurement that we have right now. It's very, very output driven. We we know bank account, we track usage, possibly, you know, to a degree we look at balances and you know how people have been, household have been savings over time at a, at a macro level. But then, you know, are those measures enough to really understand that 
people are being able to use these accounts or infrastructure in the right way and for the right purpose you know how do you then measure the success of your outcome it, uh, obviously you, you do not have a number okay but i think that there are now efforts being made in india to uh, you know make a survey of to what has been the impact of uh, some of these measures that abi has taken uh, but i think uh, as you know the earlier speakers have said uh, you you need to have uh, ability for the uh, person lower down the strata to pursue his economic activity and for that let's be very clear the see they are, they do not have land okay they do not have property so what they are what what they get access to is funds and funds coming from you know a formal sector is what will enable so and in india uh, i can one one interesting information i can tell you is that uh you know we have this microfinance institutions they had uh, limits in terms of income so people above or below particular annual income could not be financed by them so we found that in some districts over a period of time people there were no people below that income level okay so and therefore or we had to actually increase the minimum income level so that there could be people whom they could serve so so what i'm saying is uh, I, I, it may be anecdotal Uh, it may happen in a few districts or in a few states, but what we found is that the income levels that were accepted as the maximum uh, was crossed by most people in the, some of the parts of the country. So I think some of these efforts, even if you call it as mandated or you, you call it, you know, uh, you call it, it's not mandated. You, you create a supply ecosystem of credit. They have helped in raising the income levels of the people, uh, you know, uh, uh, holistically. Uh, and coming back to the one important point is i think the purpose of this loan is given is important so earlier if you said if you if you look at the mfi guidelines and rbi we said not more than 30% per consumer loan okay all other should be production but it's very important that if a family is educating a child okay i think that is an important element of the family or household becoming better economically so we kind of allowed the mfis to allow lend up to 50% for such activities so uh, so moving from moving from actually you know uh, taking uh, the loan from pure economic activity to those that could push the uh, socio economic indicators up you know so such kind of factors that have been taken and that's what you can look at so i think uh, there has not been any particular matrix but at least anecdotally we are seeing that the financial inclusion has helped people to grow uh, their income level no, no thank you so much sir i think and i'll kind of you know come back to uh, i want to come back to you pia in a moment because i also want to have you know you provide us a last word on you know how this kind of should uh, shape up uh, before before coming to you i wanted to kind of go back to maybe mohammad khalil and mary once more uh, and ask them one single question that you know as we, and we have heard that you know um, till date inclusion agenda is more of a technical and operational challenges which was anchored on business model etc but as we kind of you know think of uh, outcome focus on financial health and well being you know we also know uh, from understanding that it's more of a predictive and behavioral challenges in terms of how you uh, you know help customers you know mary talked of financial education as a tool uh, but you know how you help customer take right decisions in terms of planning and spending better uh, if they can you know summarize in maybe a one minute in terms of you know how how do they look at a service provider as a bank themselves in terms of you know measuring on these outcomes and making it a integral part of your product design and delivery in a way so what actions have you know maybe cba taken and equity bank taken uh, in this regard uh, if you can just spend maybe a minute uh, mom uh, khalil and uh, mary on that khalil we start with you yeah so I, i think one of the things that we've done is we we collaborated with for example the university of melbourne institute on social and economic policy to develop data driven measures of financial well-being that we can um basically calculate for all of our customers uh using their transactional data and and other data that we have and so what that's allowed us to do is to begin to understand the state of a customer's well-being as well as as when we start to think about trying to intervene with behavioral uh, behaviorally designed solutions um to measure the effect the the impact that that has had uh on customers. Uh and to your point, you know, what we're finding is that a lot of the needs that we see in terms of 
moving from inclusion or access, literacy, education, and capability to actually fundamentally shifting habits and behaviors is that there's a predictive challenge around helping people uh, understand their income and expense flows and, and do a lot of the, 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 the work that takes a lot of cognitive bandwidth of just actually keeping track of when do your bills arrive, which ones are frequent, which ones are infrequent, you know, how do you stay on top of your debt? Solving those is an algorithmic problem and, and, and is a data challenge and a digital challenge. And then we brought in our behavioral scientists and collaborated with universities uh, and, and our research partners to try to find meaningful interventions. And then we have this measure, this outcomes measure that allows us to evaluate whether or not these interventions are working. And it's extremely important to do that because uh, oftentimes they, they don't work uh, and there are backfires and boomerang effects that, that you need to be very wary of. Great, no thanks, thanks so much. Mary, do you want to respond to that? Yes, thank you. Uh, just to add on to what Mohammed has said, uh, I think the measure has broadened quite significantly. And uh, just going back to your question, um, we have included the measure of how many products is a customer consuming or services as one of the measures. So instead of just counting, we have two accounts or 10 accounts, we are asking for each of these accounts, how many services is this customer uh, consuming? So you see they have a savings product, they have a loan product in one form or another, they have an insurance product, are they doing an investment product? Because that also is a measure of how well you're able to help them uh, to create sustainability. And also, uh, we're also looking at um, the GDP per capita. Uh, are we making them any better at the end of the day, you know, when they operate that account? Because they have made the right investments, even if they are small investments, they are securing their future. And I think COVID has also taught us that um, and now that's even more important than before. So those are some of the things we are, we are talking about and we are doing. Focus on artificial intelligence, business intelligence systems, uh, because that also helps us uh, to know what these customers are doing, what are the trends. And of course, talking to them, we have a contact center because we get a lot of, um, of uh, feedback from them. Is there anything else that you'd want us to do for you? Or is there a different way that you'd want us to serve you? Because when you talk to customers, they give you a lot of ideas on, I don't think that works for me, but if it was this way, then it works better for me. So all that is being taken into account. And we are finding that it is shaping our agenda every single day in terms of improving the services and the products, and of course, increasing the level of usage. Thank you. Got it. No, thank you so much. And, you know, the, the way this conversation is shaping up, Pia, I want to come back to you, and maybe because you're running out of time as well, I want to have the final word <laughs> from you. You know, when the financial inclusion was vision out, some maybe 10 or 20, 15 years back, you know, the, the objective would have been great, you know, that we want to help uh, use it to kind of uh, create impact, you know, bring bring people out of poverty and, you know, uh, by formalizing the process and, and things like that. But over a period of time, you know, somehow the entire discussion on financial inclusion has, you know, just narrowed down around, you know, what and how we are able to measure it. Okay, and that measurement is more around just access and possibly usage of services. You know, we, we kind of look at our success that 99% of people have bank accounts or oh, we are financially included. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are a happy lot after all. Right. So the, the bigger question then is, is it time to redefine the vision of success and what should that be? Right. And, you know, yeah. not only just, just a measurement part of it, but beyond that, you know, what does what should what are you aiming to do actually with inclusion? Right. What are we getting with this and what advocacy efforts that we actually require in order to shift the focus from this output conversation to outcome conversation? And how should we go about doing that? Maybe I'll, I'll kind of pass on the floor to you. Yes, um, thank you for that, Jaspreet. And, you know, you're right. A lot of the measurement now is really around just access and usage. But financial inclusion has always been really, as Judith also mentioned earlier, a means to an end. And Her Majesty has always seen this as a tool for empowerment and all about human development. And so it's really financial inclusion with the end in mind. Um, in fact, uh, the office, with together with partners, has really um, worked on, um, you know, 
carving, li- looking at the evidence of how financial inclusion has a direct link, for example, in the attainment of the SDGs, direct um, link to access to health and education and um, gender equality. And so that has always been the framework. But of course, this is a journey, as Mary has pointed out also earlier. We start off with trying to measure, okay, is everyone now part of the financial system, of the formal financial system with an account? And then what is next? And so I think we are at that stage in the journey where we really need to look whether, in fact, all the actions we are collectively taking, policymakers, donors, um, um, financial service providers, are really acting with that intentionality of the outcomes that we started off um, you know, the, having in terms of pushing financial inclusion. And in this role, I think there's really a need for a collective um, review, and especially in light of the pandemic, where we see how important resilience is, to say what we define now as our success. And um, toward this end, uh, Her Majesty, the office is actually convening a financial health working group for the very purpose of really trying to understand how do we say we are successful in financial inclusion as it contributes to the positive outcomes that we want to see. There are many frameworks, Judith has mentioned um, some of them earlier, but it would be really good to, uh, you know, to collectively agree and understand the concepts of financial health. How will we measure it? What will be the key asks to policymakers, to the private sector in really pushing for financial inclusion that leads to human development and development outcomes. No, thank you so much. I think we could not have a better, you know, closure to the session. I am sure, uh, and as I'm told, we are running a lot of time as well. Uh, we, I did have many other questions as well, but I, I'll, I'm happy to, you know, basically just say at this point of time that this is an emerging topic and an emerging paradigm of discussion. We do hope to, you know, continue uh, building a collaborative coalition across the globe uh, between developing and developed countries and the LDCs coming together to, you know, explore that, you know, whatever we are doing in the space of financial inclusion can have an impact focus and we, we target the right objective and goals to achieve the SDGs. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for taking time out and sharing your thoughts on this uh, important topic. And we do hope to, you know, continue having this conversation uh, as you move on. Thank you so much, everyone. Definitely. Thank you, Jaspreet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.